This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, I talked to Seth Godin, author, entrepreneur, blogger, speaker, and our preeminent thinker on how ideas succeed. the marketplace of ideas i'm colin marshall seth godin is a thinker blogger and author of books about how ideas are conceived how they spread and how they're executed he's also the founder and ceo of squidoo and he's just added to his body of popular books including permission marketing purple cow and all marketers are liars with the new linchpin are you indispensable seth welcome to the program well thank you for having me i read linchpin by in, in kind of a strange way i spread it out as I read your older books. And so whenever I was reading Lynchpin, I was also reading another Seth Godin book. And what I noticed doing this is that Lynchpin, it just feels different in like a visceral way. It feels different than your other books. And I heard in another interview with uh, Merlin Mann, former guest on this show, actually, that he, uh, that you said that Lynchpin was actually the hardest book you've ever had to write. Are these two things related? Oh, for sure. You know, the, most of the books that I've written have, other than probably The Dip, have been written to organizations, written to people who are doing strategy, written to people who are working at um, sort of the bloodless act of spreading an idea. And this book is personal. It's not personal in, about, in that it's about me. It's personal in that it's about you. And that's a pretty different responsibility for the author. But the argument I'm, I'm pushing forward is frightening to people. And so I had to handle it in a way where I was pushing hard enough to make an impact, but I was treating your fears um, and, and skepticism with respect because otherwise it becomes a Jeremiah that isn't very helpful. How much of the difficulty comes purely from having to switch the whole way the whole way you think about your audience, for you said you, you write to organizations, to idea spreaders, now it's to living, breathing humans in a sense. Was a lot of the difficulty simply changing your own mindset, and, but then besides what you ex just explained? Um, not really. I mean, for me, there's a revolution going on, and I've been lucky that I've been able to carve out a niche by chronicling that revolution and talking about some of the elements of it. The death of the industrial age is the most important uh, sort of historical shift of our time. And a lot of people don't see it happening, even though it is changing their lives every day. For me, then, the, the purpose of this book is to bring home what that death is going to mean to everyone and what the opportunity it creates means to everyone. But when I'm writing, I'm not visualizing what the, the reader looks like, because judging from my inbound email, there is no way to characterize anything about my readers, where they live, how old they are, what their gender is, what their race is, what they do for a living. They don't have anything in common other than the fact that they don't have anything in common. <laughs> now, you have a bit of an angle in the book, and I don't know how deliberate it was, maybe it was, that it seems like you're somewhat angry that the, the death of the industrial age, as you've called it, has resulted in a bit of a bit of a bill of false goods being sold to a lot of people. Have I characterized that right? Well, th I, there is no angle. I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of gimmicks, but this book doesn't have one. Ah. Uh, but yeah, I'm angry, and what I'm angry about is that the the bill of goods was sold to us 10, 20, 30 years ago, and it is that if we do what we're told and are compliant, uh, we will be rewarded, and it bothers me when I see a bank uh, which has more power and insight take advantage of someone and then the person loses their house. And it bothers me when I see someone work somewhere for 20 years doing what they think they're supposed to do and then lose their job when it's not their fault. Uh, and it bothers me when we organize schools to create ever more compliant workers for ever more mediocre factories. Uh, I think that we need to uh, stop uh, burying our potential and instead start embracing the fact that there's this huge opportunity here, even though it makes people uncomfortable to tell them the truth. I want to know, how did you get to the point where you 
thought to yourself, I have to declare this in a book-length statement. It seems like something that people should be talking about more, but they're not. How did it come to you to say something about it, to say something big about it? Some people write books because they write books. Some people write books to make a living. I write books because I have no choice. Uh, (laughs) Writing a book for me isn't uh, a fun pastime, nor is it a lucrative way to spend my time. Uh, Writing a book is something I do when the idea won't permit me to do anything but that. So unbeknownst to me, I'd been working on this book for 10 years. Uh, it, It comes from, you know, things that started happening to me when I was five or 10 years old. And having seen these things unfold, I wanted to be able to share the idea in a way that was more cogent uh, and made a clearer argument than I ever could in a series of blog posts. And that's the best reason I know to go to all the trouble of writing a book. Now, the roots of this idea in Lynchpin, or these, this suite of ideas, it goes back to really when you were five? Yeah, I mean, I grew up with ADD. Uh, a lot of people did. I was lucky that my parents uh, resisted the temptation to give me meds. But I have you know, plenty of scars from the push uh, to fit in, the push to sit still, uh, from the dominating culture of uh, the placement office and the homecoming king and the um, mindset that said the most obedient person wins. Because I was never good at being that person. And the way that the system enforces it is by explaining to people who are uh, not good at being that person, that they're not going to amount to very much. And I was really lucky uh, as a teenager to be able to find an outlet doing entrepreneurial projects, uh, doing things that are outside the box and getting support for doing them. And so now when I see people, uh, you know, kids growing up, people in school who are going through that same thing, I have this almost irresistible urge to hug them and then shake the people who are telling them they better take their meds and fit in. (laughs) I've got to say, I do feel that because I I come from the generation that is perhaps the most the most uh, riddle and medicated of all generations. I never got it myself, but I did have the same feeling of um, not sort of actively not wanting to fit in. And this book, Lynchpin, lines up with some ideas I've had recently just thinking to myself how to how to do things, how to make interesting stuff, how to get that stuff out there. And I think of my favorite creators, you know, my personal icons, and they all seem to be a little bit insane. And that, that's reflected, I would say, in the text of Lynchpin. It seems like a slight amount of what we, would, what we maybe used to call insanity is necessary. Are you on board with that? Well, I, I like the definition of insanity as uh, doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for different results. <laughs> different and, than I mean, but yes. Yeah, right. Well, by my definition, the only people who aren't insane are the people you're talking about. It's uh-huh. the people in society who go to Las Vegas and keep pulling the same slot machine arm. It's the people who keep uh, showing up at one place or another and waiting for the fickle finger of fate to pick them out and make them a superstar. It's the people who go on American Idol thinking that that's the way they're going to become uh, a musical hit. Uh, I think that is insanity because all rational thought would tell you that that doesn't make any sense at all. And instead, it's people who dig deep and do what I am coining as emotional labor. The people who uh, are letting their desire to make change happen drive their decisions and are willing to make lots of small steps in their quest to make a big difference. Those people are not insane. So we'll call that not insane, but we can say that that goes against our every ingrained impulse. That's right. Because, I mean, people could accurately call us nuts. You know, that we are nuts about getting this done and we are willing to do things that people are afraid of, including being laughed at, in order to make it get done. The thing that's fascinating is how did it become ingrained? You know, it became ingrained uh, because evolution rewarded people who fit in. That if you were in a village 50,000 years ago, and you had a fight with the chief over uh, an issue of how to chant some song, uh, they would throw you out and then a saber-toothed tiger would eat you. And that means you didn't have any kids. So there is a large reason, in, in, and you can see this in plenty of animals, where sticking with the herd is the way to ensure your survival. 
what our economy has done in just the last few years is turned around and said, if you are in the herd, you are going to fail. And that is a massive shift. And we are not prepared for it. But in fact, it's what the economy keeps rewarding. Would you rather own stock in Dell or Apple? You know, Dell equals the herd. And Apple equals standing out. That what the market keeps saying over and over again is, if you're selling average stuff to average people, they will find a way to get it cheaper. And therefore, you're not going to do very well. But if you're willing to sell standout stuff to people who care, whatever that thing you're selling is, you're likely to do better. There's a theme I take from this, from what you've said and from, of course, what you write in the book. I don't know if you use this term in the book, but I, I think of it to myself as avoiding fungibility, as that being a, a certain goal of my life, fungibility being, for a listener who might not know, the economic term for stuff that's as good as other stuff of the same kind. You can, you know, one scoop of this stuff is as good as another scoop. And I think of this as avoiding being a scoop of humanity that can be, can be replaced just as easily with another one. I believe in the book you use uh, the example of classical musicians, is that correct, who are all trained well, but one can, one can do the same thing as another, and that's why they're sort of uh, paid somewhat low? Exactly. You know, he here's a good question that you might ask yourself, which is, do you deserve to get paid more than the cheapest person I can find to do this? And if so, why? Now, what happens if you train to be a classical musician is you are trained to comply with the conductor and the score, that your job is not to make any mistakes. And for the first 10 years you're doing it, that's what you're pushed to do. Well, this leads to a huge surplus of second violinists, a huge surplus in every city in America. You can go on Craigslist and put together an orchestra in two days uh, for a few thousand bucks for a performance. But... That doesn't explain Ben Zander and Yo-Yo Ma and the superstar musicians. Because in fact, what those guys are doing is not fitting in. What those guys are doing is saying, you know, if you can find someone to be Yo-Yo Ma cheaper than I can be Yo-Yo Ma, go hire him. Good luck. <laughs> Knock yourself out. And that's the secret, is not to be yet another scoop. But think about what systems we've built in our society. What is a resume but a brand name filled chronicle of compliance? If you have a resume, what you're saying is, look at this evidence that I can comply with the system. And if you hire people by screening their resumes, that's what you're getting. It's what you signed up for. That these are replaceable people. There's a big stack of them. I'll just, if this guy doesn't take the job, I'll just get the next one. And this is an idea that I can trace back, in a sense, to your older book, Purple Cow, in which you say that, and tell me if I get anything wrong, but in which you say that, you can be excellent, sure, but excellence is not so much the deal. It's, it's being remarkable. And what I took from especially the section on musicians and linchpin was that, if this is correct, it's important, was that a, a linchpin of a, of a musician may well not be as technically excellent as the second violinist you talk about, as the sort of fungible musician. Is that true? That's absolutely true. And you're getting the, the essence of the first part of my book, which is to say that there's no shortage of competence anymore. And showing up and saying, I'm slightly more competent than everyone else, and I deserve this gig, doesn't work. That what we're looking for are incompetent people who are incompetent in interesting ways. That we don't buy a record because auto-tune was used perfectly. We buy a record because the musician changed the way we think about the world when we listen to it. Now, when I hear you articulate these ideas, I'm definitely on board, but how? give me a sense of how hard it is to actually get people to believe this. Right, and that's what this whole entire second half of the book is about, is what Steve Pressfield calls the resistance. The, you know, the, the biological part of our brain, I call it the lizard brain, whose job it is to get us to fit in, to not be laughed at, to survive, to have lots of kids, and to get revenge. We can do functional MRI or simple thought experiments to show how powerful the lizard brain is. You know, if you're on a, uh, an airplane and you're writing a great chapter of a great novel and you're on a roll and then you hit turbulence and the plane drops 10,000 feet, during that drop, you're probably not doing a lot of good writing. What you're doing is bending over, screaming at the top of your lungs, we're going to die, we're going to die. That's because the lizard brain was activated. It is trying to get you to survive. 
And this voice in our head is not always the voice of sheer terror. It's the voice of, well, I don't really feel like it. It's the voice of, well, he doesn't want me to call him so soon. It's the voice of, well, I better polish off this edge because people might yell at me. The editor won't, won't print this article if I leave this in. And so we take off all the rough edges. And we've been living with the resistance our whole lives. And it feels like part of us. When people read the book, a lot of people, fortunately for me, because I have a track record with them, gave me the benefit of the doubt and are trying on the glasses and say, wow, I wonder what the world looks like when I look at it this way. But some people immediately go into lizard brain mode and find 10 reasons why I'm uh, either crazy or it doesn't apply to them. You can disagree with my economic thesis, but what you can't do is say that the resistance doesn't exist and that the main objection that people have when it comes down to doing the real art of it is that they're afraid. And I'll give you the most prosaic business-like example I can think of. I hear from a lot of real estate agents because uh, real estate agents are sort of entrepreneurs and sort of on their own, but also doing system type work. And they say, sending me their little photo ridden uh, business cards, I'm a purple cow. You can tell because my business card is purple, <laughs> right? Or I'm a purple cow because I'm announcing to the world that I'm the best real estate agent in Gainesville. I bet you get purple stuff in the mail all the time. I have a whole collection of it, yes. <laughs> and my argument to them is they're just doing little tiny tweaks on mediocre work. And that when you find a true purple cow, there's like a real estate broker, I think he's in Ohio, who has a staff of 12 who aren't real estate brokers, who do nothing but organize his time. And he sells five times as many houses as anyone else in the state because he's approaching the act of selling a house in a fundamentally different way than any other real estate broker in the state. That is gutsy because that could fail and then everyone would make fun of you. But most people, when the resistance sets in, figure out how to back off just enough that what they did is defensible. But what artists do is work that's indefensible. And in your own life, at what point did you come to realize that, and uh, you probably didn't call them lizard brain or resistance at first, but when did you start realizing that this was a problem? I mean, for you personally, when did you realize this is something that I've got to work against? Well, I was a book packager before I was an author, um, before I started my internet company. And what a book packager does is come up with ideas. Uh, send them to book publishers, and if they like them, you get paid money and you go make them. So I did books on personal finance and gardening and lots of other things. And there's an enormous amount of pressure in that business and every other one to basically write dummies books, to basically do what someone did last week and put a slight spin on it because it's easier to sell. And that voice in my head kept pushing me to say, you know what? I'm struggling. This is really hard. I should fit in more. And Finally, I came to the realization that every time I listened to that voice, I was heading down the road, the road to ruin. Every time I listened to that voice, I was becoming more mediocre, not worthy of seeking out. And so I started using it as a compass. And anytime that voice tells me I shouldn't do something, that's how I know I'm onto something and I go ahead and do it. <laughs> I did like that line you said in another interview that, yeah, if the resistance if the resistance tells me not to, I do it. And that, that is another, another way of thinking that may sound somewhat nuts to people. But I would imagine that the times that that has actually, actually really, really harmed you, you could count on uh, one hand if you even needed that. Well, sure. And the reason is because it's a little hyperbolic. You know, if the resistance says, uh, don't go up to that uh, security guard in Cuba who's standing there with the AK-47 and tell him a joke. <laughs> you know, there's another executive function in my brain that's smart enough to differentiate between artistic endeavor and suicide. Um, and so that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is uh, when I say to my publisher, you know, I want to give this whole thing away for free. Or when I say to my publisher, uh, you know, we're going to not do any media whatsoever to promote this book. We're going to do it 100% online with the long tail of people who have small tribal audiences. And my publisher says, that's crazy. We have too much invested. Don't do it. That's how I know I'm on the right track. Because deep down, I know that if I just did what he wanted, he wouldn't be able to blame me if it didn't work. And my art 
is in challenging the appropriate parts of the status quo uh, and saying things that people believe but have been afraid to say before. And it does seem like people people don't actually fear, well, they, they do fear being shot by a Cuban security guard, sure, but that's not a fear that comes into their lives. Their, their fear seems to be almost exclusively about being laughed at and nothing more. I mean, is that what you find? That's exactly right. And so this fear of being laughed at becomes the dominant force of most people's lives. They come home from work. How was your day? It was terrible. Why was it terrible? Because at three o'clock in the afternoon, the boss looked at me funny. Well, okay, let's go over this. How many times in the history of your company has that led the next day to the boss firing you or anyone? The answer is <laughs> never. The way you get fired is you're one of the 10,000 people on the assembly line who did what they were told, and then there's a giant layoff. But the people who are doing innovative work, the people who are standing up and speaking out and making a difference, they're never getting fired. It just doesn't happen. And even if they do get fired, they don't instantly then become homeless, starved to death, and watch their family die or at their feet. What happens is they're instantly scooped up because they're scarce. And yet, we have built this entire system from you know, the age of three playing Candyland on up to say the way to succeed is to be obedient. And it's a real problem. There is a certain amount, a certain extent to which when somebody gets to a certain, a certain level of public profile, and I mean, it seems like anybody to be a linchpin needs to get to a certain height of profile, but say a public figure like yourself, no matter who you are, if you're that well known, you're going to get laughed at a certain amount, like you are going to be laughed at. How do, how do you personally deal with that? Well, let me first describe a, a distinction between the monkeys and Bob Dylan. Uh, Bob Dylan gets laughed off or booed off the stage every 10 years, whether he wants to or not. He, he got booed off the stage when he went electric, and then again when he went gospel, and most recently with his horrendous Christmas album. <laughs> uh, and the monkeys never get booed off the stage because the monkeys performed last train to Clarksville exactly the same way they did it 30 or 40 years ago. Here's the thing. Bob Dylan keeps selling out stadiums, and no one goes to see the monkeys because the monkeys aren't doing anything worth noticing. So there are people who have succeeded who then just keep playing the same song over and over again, whatever that is that they do. And I think if we look at internet companies, uh, the difference between Google and what happened to a lot of the people who were winning after the last bubble uh, is that those companies hunkered down and Google keeps failing and keeps getting laughed at. That's a decision you got to make. And for me, part of it is insulating myself from people whose opinion I don't really care about, but who laugh quite loudly. Uh, I don't need to expose myself to that because if I did enough of that, I would hunker down too because it's no fun. <laughs> in, in, instead, you know, if someone sends me an email with their real name on it and I've engaged with them, I really care about what they have to say and it informs my work and makes it better. But I try very hard to ignore hecklers. I haven't checked my reviews on Amazon in months and months because they didn't do anything to make my work better. And so it, I, th I, think of, I think of this Bob Dylan example of him, of him staying relevant and at the same time, not unrelated, getting booed off the stage periodically. And that, in my mind, that being booed off the stage, that being laughed at, it actually becomes an indicator, a positive indicator of how relevant he's going to stay. So there, there must be some value. I mean, is there a place where, or is there, is there a way you keep you keep an eye on your equivalent of this, like so you know you're being provocative enough, so you know you're taking enough risks? Well, yeah, that's what the blog does for me because I do it every day. I've limited myself to one post a day, though I could do 10. And so I try in that one post to push my envelope, whatever it is in the moment, not to provoke people for the sake of provoking them. I mean, we've certainly seen political commentators do that, and I find that a sad sideshow. Um, but to push people because it's good for both of us, to get people to think about something in a way they haven't thought about it before. And if the response I get from people is that was obvious, then I know that I'm given into the resistance. And if the response from people I get is, I hate you and I'm never going to interact with you again, <laughs> then I say, you know, maybe I should rethink how hard I pushed this time because uh, it didn't resonate with some of the people I was hoping to resonate with. And that's a fine line. I don't have to walk it. I could go all the way out to the extreme and just scream and yell about, you know, 
baby seals getting nuked with clubs every day, every day. But my feeling is that part of my challenge is to both go deep and, and touch people in a way that matters and go broad to the extent that there's more than a trivial number of people I'm able to interact with. It seems to me from reading your blog and reading Lynchpin that I do feel I do feel a bit of a relationship between those two projects, between this new book and between the blog. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure why. Maybe it's maybe it's because the blog posts are are somewhat short and the book is written in short chunks of text. Maybe it's that superficial. But is there a real intellectual relationship between specifically this book and what you do on the blog? Well, the blog has ruined my ability to write long form. Uh, I, I mean, when I started writing for Fast Company, when they were selling 300 pages of ads on issue, the Alan Weber used to push me because he needed longer columns so he could sell more ads. And I had a hard time even then making the columns long enough. I mean, it's hard work to make it short. Uh, and I wasn't willing to sort of trade that in for the easy thing of always double explaining myself and making it longer. And the blog reinforces that, that you could always write the longest blog post you've ever written, but it wouldn't be better than a short blog post. And so what I'm trying to do in the book, and I think Tribes was like this to an extent, is match the rhythm that the internet has forced people who read to engage in. And that rhythm is not 40-page uh, chapters. That rhythm is now two-page chapters because if the idea doesn't resonate you, with you within two pages, you get restless. So what that means is my chapters have to be uh, about smaller things, but then hopefully 20 of them add up to what used to be one chapter. So this is interesting. I want to be sure to nail it down. It is, to your mind, an issue, a rhythmic issue, not one of, of absolute book length, because Lynchpin is not, it's not a, a paper, th well, it's paper, of course, it's not paper thin. It's a regular sized book, but it is written in smaller chunks, and I take it that you, you uh, find, you thus find the sort of hand wringing about books shrinking down to nothing in the age of the internet to be a little overblown that it's more about just the way the content is organized? Well, you know, there's a whole discussion we can have about the book industry and how they cruelly abuse the ideas that are handed to them by their authors. Most authors I know complain that their publisher makes them make their books too long. Um, but every once in a while, I run into an author whose editor... Uh, didn't have the discipline to make their book shorter. There's this mindset that a book has to be a certain length in order to sell. Uh, and th so that gets into a whole other discussion. I do believe that we are pushing uh, ideas to be too digestible and too short if we want them to spread. The distinction is, you know, the intellectuals who are reading, uh, you know, Gravity Rainbow in 1962 or Thomas Pynchon in 1966, those people, there weren't very many of those people. So there are actually more people now who are engaging in big ideas than before. But if you want to reach them, there's no question that you have to give them something to talk about. And that's Malcolm Gladwell's greatest gift, is that after you read a Gladwell book, you are desperate to tell other people what you just read, which is how the idea spreads. And then I think about Malcolm Gladwell's books, and of course I think about the cascade of imitators that followed afterward. And sure. it seems like, do, do you see this as a, I see this as kind of a cheapening of the idea book that's, that's resulted. Do you see it the same way? Well, no, I think it's a symptom of how powerful the lizard is on editors and publishers and <laughs> writers. Because, you know, I, little known fact, the, the guys uh, who started doing the dummies books, I knew the the agent. And the dummies books were first uh, only for computers. And I was the guy who came up with the idea of doing dummies books about everything. And I did 30 proposals for them at their request of everything from cooking for dummies to public speaking for dummies. Uh, they stole my idea the only time ever anyone in publishing has ever stolen anything from oh. me. And so I'm the one you should blame for the fact that there are 500 dummies books. <laughs> Once you have a format, anyone knows how to copy it, and anyone is eager to copy it. And so Freakonomics comes out, and every economics professor in the world wants to write their own version. And a book like Tipping Point, which takes sociological uh, insights by other people and strings them together into a cogent argument, comes out, and a hundred other people want to do it. That's because you can't get made fun of 
for copying the format. And that's been around forever, forever and ever. So after uh, Charles Dickens started serializing stuff, a hundred authors started doing serialized stuff. And after Mark Twain wrote a certain kind of way, lots of people wanted to do it. David Sedaris led to this whole generation of self-deprecating humorists. That's not new. What's new is the industry jumps on it ever faster because the cycle for books and music used to be so long that it didn't make sense to do copycats because it took too long to come out. But now, if you can do it in you know, a song in a week or a book in three months, might as well because you can sell some. And you no, know, I'm not happy about it, but as long as I'm going first, it's okay with me. <laughs> and my favorite illustration of this, I mean, it, it goes even more superficially than copying a format. I think of when uh, Jim Collins' Good to Great came out, and then out came the tidal wave of business books with red covers. Yeah, I mean, th design also has cycles, and Myriad Pro Bold Condensed is the font of the moment, and it won't <laughs> be the font of the moment in two years. That keeps things interesting. What I find amazing is people who are ostensibly creative, people who are calling themselves artists are really just chickens who are busy following the, you know, the, the trend. And that's why a chip kid when it comes to cover design is so rare because he refuses to even copy himself. <laughs> He's been and a guest on this show. I, I totally agree with you. He's a great guy. And so the, so the, you know, the, the internet is what's really cool here because it used to be that industry could keep the outliers from even being seen. The outliers didn't show up in the bookstore. The outliers didn't show up in the record store. And what the internet does is it lets Danger Mouse put the Gray album up. It's up. It's out. You can't stop it. And that means that the cycle of true innovation is going to get ever faster because without uh, the accountants to tell you you can't do that thing, that thing is going to get done. And the audience, which has now been trained to look for the innovative and the new, is going to want ever more of it. So, you know, Lady Gaga's half-life uh, is going to be really short because once people get the Lady Gaga joke, once they get the story, unless she reinvents herself, they're going to go on to the next one. <laughs> Whereas someone like Madonna could have run it for 10 years. It's going to be hard for me to see Lady Gaga in the year 2020 doing very well. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. You can hear this interview again or any in the show's history at our website, colinmarshallradio.com. Have any questions, comments, feedback, positive, negative, neutral, or otherwise? Send that along to colin at colinmarshallradio.com. My guest is writer, speaker, blogger, thinker, entrepreneur, Seth Godin, author of Lynchpin, Are You Indispensable? Given what we've said about the specific publishing microclimate that we find ourselves in right now, when you're putting out a book like Lynchpin, or specifically the book Lynchpin, what did you think to yourself that you wanted to avoid being like? Um, I never had that discussion with myself once. Oh. No, the, the idea was, I have to write this book. I know what this book is. I have to chip away all the things that aren't part of this book, and then I have to get this book in the hands of the people who I need to read it. And there wasn't a strategic conversation about much of anything. The, the, the one thing I caved on was the cover. That's not the original cover. Uh, I am lucky, at least I can use the past tense, I was lucky, I'll probably never get it again, to have cover approval. I had one cover that I stuck with through more than 60 alternative covers presented by my publisher until I finally realized just how frightened they were and I gave them my second best cover instead. They were, they were frightened of your cover? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my cover was a silhouette of a lizard and um, it was downbeat and frightening <laughs> and would require people to say, why the hell is there a lizard on the cover of that book? And uh, my publisher had a lot at stake with this book and felt strongly that since they were responsible for selling the book, that they shouldn't issue it with a cover that they were sure would fail. And so I respected, <laughs> I respected their professional judgment enough to give them my other cover. Now, I want to put this book in context with your other ones, because when reading your previous books, I 
If a friend came up to me and asked what I was reading, I could always say, well, this is a book about, in some sense, marketing. I could always say, yeah, it's, it's this guy, Seth Godin. He writes marketing books. But when I was reading Lynchpin, I did not feel that I could say it was a marketing book. Uh, and truthfully, I couldn't, I couldn't capture it in saying, well, this is a book about marketing. Because there are elements of that, and I know that's a broad subject designation, but there's so much else as well. This is, do you, do you feel the book extends so vastly far beyond the reach of your others like I do? Well, I want to be egomaniacal for one minute here and argue that in the last 12 years, I have changed the definition of marketing. Ah. When I wrote Permission Marketing, marketing meant advertising. And over the last few years, thanks to the work of some really smart people and my relentless pursuit of this, marketing now means pretty much everything. The way you answer the phone, the way the product is designed, uh, the, every story that goes with your political campaign or whatever it is you're doing now is easy to talk about as if it is marketing, which is all brand new. You know, when people say, I hate marketers, what they really mean is, I hate people who advertise and, and promote average stuff for average people. They don't say that Jonathan Ive, the guy who designed the iPhone, is a marketer, but I do because that's what he did was he created a, an interface and an interaction that made us willing to pay extra for poor service. <laughs> By that definition, Lynchpin is a marketing book in that it's purple cow for people. That what it says is everyone is in a race to uh, market their ideas to the world. And if those ideas are just warmed over recycled safe ideas, you will fail. And if you believe that the way to carve your path through the world is to be a compliant cog in the industrial system, you will fail. Uh, but no, I'm not calling it a marketing book either because at some point the word marketing means nothing. And I'm willing to draw the line here and say this is just a book about art and life and making a difference. I think back to the interview I mentioned before that you did with Merlin Mann recently, and he says something that resonated with me in it. He says, you, you write so well and so engagingly about a subject I usually can't stand. He means marketing. <laughs> and I right. mean, to, to the extent, to an extent, I'm the same way. I, I do pick up the occasional book that is explicitly about marketing and put it down because I just can't. It's like not even, it's like not reading something that a human wrote, essentially. Yep. But you would say then, I'm just going off of your last answer, that we, Merlin and I, can stand and even like your books because marketing for you is a different thing than marketing for Joe Bestseller. That's absolutely correct. That's what I'm saying. That um, there wasn't a category for the kind of books I wanted to write, so I had to pick one. And so I picked, you know, when you're in the bookstore, you have to be in a category. So I picked one, marketing, and put the ti in the title of permission marketing and put it in the title of all marketers are liars. I learned a lesson when I called my readers liars in the title, <laughs> which is they hate that. And you shouldn't make that mistake twice. The opportunity here is this. A book is magical because unlike click, 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 stumble upon, when someone trusts you enough to read your words, they're letting your voice into their head. And you don't get to do that very often. You know, the thing about movies is they cost $100 million to make. A book can be written by one person. That's a privilege. And if I can get into someone's head, even 100 people, and speak to them calmly at their pace and help them see the world differently, then um, that is a chance that few people will get, and I view it as a privilege. You sound to me like you're much more, you're much more book optimistic than many, and I mean that in the sense of books as the actual physical printed things. Although I don't know what is your are you do you have a position on this this discussion? So many people want to throw into about whether eBooks are better or printed ones, or or whether everything has its own individual place in the more fragmented media landscape. Where do you, where do you fall on this whole reading books versus reading the internet versus reading eBooks? Yada 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 discussion. Oh yeah, I totally. I have a lot of opinions. First of all, 175,000 books are published every year, and 165,000 of them are worthless crap. <laughs> Number two, the industry of making books is about to fall apart completely and uh, the economics of it are broken. They've been broken for a while and what ebooks are doing is skimming off the top the stuff that made all the money. And as a result, the industry of making books will never be the same and never recover. I believe that books are going to become like vinyl LPs 
They are going to be uh, a wonderful thing for a small part of the population, uh, a reminder of how things used to be, and in some ways a better fidelity way of getting the idea. But for the vast majority of things that are currently printed in book form, to which I would say that includes uh, most nonfiction and most entertaining fiction, there is no good economic reason to chop down a tree, ship it on a return basis to a local bookstore, hope that people find it, and then sell it. I think instead what we're going to see is that uh, ebook readers are going to get way better and cheaper in just 18 months, that the act by an author of distributing a book directly to the reader uh, with many of the elements that digital can give us is going to be incredibly powerful. And authors with followings, authors with tribes, authors with ideas that can spread will look at the alternative, which is to wait a year, give up most of the money, and probably fail. And they will say, no, I'd rather just make it digital. I take it you see your own books in the future as being digital? I think this is probably the last book I'm ever going to write. You're going to go entirely in, it's going to be, you're going to shift to the ebook format perhaps, or it's going to be? I don't know what I'm going to do. I, you know, as I said earlier, I don't set out to write a book. Um, And this one was really painful and I'm really glad that I did it. But right now I'm so exhausted by the process and so dubious about the system of hoops that you have to go through (laughs) to make it happen that I'm not sure why it would be worth it to do it again. Now, I reserve the right to change my mind, but the fact is that, you know, I don't do this for the money, but if you were doing it for the money, it doesn't make sense. And if you're not doing it for the money, if you're doing it to spread ideas, it's not clear to me that this process lends itself. And the people who run publishing companies, the big publishing companies in America, are so clueless and so... um, filled with fear about what the future brings, that I am not optimistic that the ones that I've met will get their act together in time to leverage the head start that they have. On the subject of not being in it for the money, I've read and heard you say before in other contexts that the less you actively try to make money, you yourself, the better you do. Why is that? Well, You know, I am not going to put myself in the category of visual artists like Picasso or Shepard Fairey. But the same thing is true with them. That what you sell when you do art is um, the souvenir of the idea. Because the idea is always free. You know, ideas that spread win. And the best ideas for spreading are the free ones. So the question is, what's the souvenir in terms of um, what is it that people will pay for? The Grateful Dead proved this in a, in a really elegant way. They made almost no money ever selling records. They made their money by organizing the tribe and putting on a show for them that traveled around the world. The more the dead tried to do art that resonated with their tribe, the more likely the tribe was to want to come together and to pay for the privilege. So if you do something to make money, you're probably doing something to satisfy uh, in the short term the demand of what the market thinks it wants. And when you do that, you very quickly become an oldies act. You very (laughs) quickly become somebody who's doing something that will get applause the first time you say it. And you don't do things that make people uncomfortable because uh, then they're not going to pay you. And it turns out, having thought about this for a while, is if I let go of all that and just do say what I think needs to be said, if I just point out the things that I would point out, even if there was no money on the table, if I can make the audience uncomfortable, some people, some members of the tribe will find that remarkable enough or interesting enough that they'll want the public speech or they'll want some other interaction that in fact costs money. So the more I focus on the art and the less I focus on the commerce, the more the commerce seems to take care of itself. I take it you see no future in focus grouping things. Well, there are two kinds of focus groups. Most focus groups are run to give the person who runs the focus group deniability. (laughs) They're run to creating, it's a committee on the hoof. It's a committee that lets you smooth out the edges and do something that's beyond reproach. And I think that that, and most people who know anything about focus groups uh, say that that is a complete misuse of what they're for. On the other hand, there are some very clever ways 
to interact with the real world, to learn stuff. And I'll give you one simple example because it's not really a talk about uh, focus groups, which is uh, some focus groups are run where they'll get 10 people together and they'll talk about uh, a new product and, and get some feedback. And then at the end, they'll say, okay, we'd like to reward you for coming. Would you rather have $40 or the product we just talked about? And that is a really brilliant way to find out what people think your stuff is worth because it's unvarnished truth. If you've got a $200 clock radio and someone would rather have 40 bucks than your $200 clock radio, you just learned a really valuable lesson about what the first tier of people in the market are going to think. Now, I'm not saying you have to listen to it, but so many things come to market and I'm thinking of the new uh, Palm uh, iPhone killer which is not long for this world, you know, at what point did the guys at Palm stop saying, uh, this is what we think, and start saying, now, someone who isn't our mother-in-law or sister, what will they think? Will they put up money? I don't think they ever had that conversation. I've thought a lot about this topic in recent months in terms of the way, I mean, motivated by your books and others, uh, that in terms of the way that someone should think about these days, balancing out, addressing or satiating audience demands directly and adhering to their vision of whatever the thing they make should be. And is this, is this some sort of dialectical synthesis to be achieved to your mind or is, do you think of it in a different way? Well, I think it depends on whether you're owned by Wall Street or not. Oh. Wall Street's stated goal is to make as much money as possible. And what that means is they want your company to go from the early adopters to the mass market to saturation and then die. That it's okay with them that you jump the shark. You know, that happy days in Fonzie should have run for as long as possible because <laughs> the network is a public company. Extract maximum revenue. But when Jerry Seinfeld turned down hundreds of millions of dollars to do one more season of Seinfeld, he wasn't focused on maximizing anything. What he said was, I just don't have this in me to do the art at the level I want to do it by. And that act is the act of a human being, not the act of a corporation. And so I guess the question is, are, which are you? If you're a corporation and your charter says you should maximize profits in the short and long run, then you're going to make different decisions about satisfying market demand than if you are an entrepreneur who owns her own company or if you are an individual who has a career. Or if you're, uh, if you're an artist who just works as an independent person, those people have to deal with the balance of how much is enough and what am I trying to maximize? Am I trying to maximize cash? Am I trying to maximize my connection with my core tribe? You know, we look at companies like Harley Davidson, which could do no wrong and got bigger and bigger and bigger until, whoops, one day they woke up and they're not selling as many motorcycles as they can anymore. And in fact, they're in some trouble. The reason is they let the tribe get too big. People who didn't care as much join. They satisfied a larger and larger audience until the core of the audience found they could live without them. And that ever-rising expectation of size, I think, is a curse of our always-on, always-maximizing industry. And maximizing might not be the best thing to do. Now, I would bet the individuals, the people who work for themselves, the artists, the, the people who are more self-contained, who read your book, who read Lynchpin, they will hear this stuff in the way you've written it in the book, and they will think it's, they, may, they might not have thought of it themselves, but it'll seem natural. I imagine to the sort of people who often read your books, uh, the types that, for example, work at large companies or, or do management in them and hand out your books to their employees, some of this has come off as fairly heretical. Oh, yeah, on purpose. But the good news, the thing that amazed me is that they, I was right in that they understand that if they don't get this behavior happening in their colleagues, their company's going to fold. And that is a huge leap for someone to make after reading 100 pages of a book. But that's exactly what is happening. That what's happening is, you know, the largest food company in the world. I was talking uh, to some key people there. And they're saying, yeah, we can't somehow trick people into buying more potato chips. <laughs> people can't eat any more potato chips. So we got to figure out a way to get people in this company who are going to do more than what we did five years ago louder because that's not the answer. And that was the, you know, one of the 
many gratifying things have come out of this book, but one of the gratifying things was to hear people in some of my traditional constituencies get the fact that they need to fundamentally change who they hire, how they hire them, what they reward, how they train them, and what they consider to be successful. And that's really cool to see that happen. And in all of these sections of the book, the term art is very important. You talk about artists, you talk about the kind of art they do and that the, the art value that they add to things. That's not a specific term you use, but you talk about them and you use the word art in kind of the same way I would think is the way you use marketing in that your own idea of it may differ substantially from many people's. So what is your, what is your art? What is your, the way you think of art? Well, we can all, we can all agree that Monet was an artist, but he was also a painter. We can agree that uh, Joseph Boys or William Shakespeare were artists, but they didn't paint. And we can probably agree um, that uh, a modern author or playwright is an artist. But then I can extend it even further to places you might have to think twice, like the receptionist I used to know at Kodak in Rochester, who could never po ever be replaced by an automated system because she knew everyone's name and she made them feel at home and she was a person doing work that you could not write down in a manual and that she set out to be generous to do more than she was paid for and to connect with people and change them for the better and so that's my definition of art is somebody who does work without a manual work that hasn't been done before they're improvising they're doing it for generous reasons not just because it's their job and because they're changing people for the better. We don't have another word for it other than artist. So that's the word I picked. With these principles, or not, not, not so much principles, maybe observations about what works with, uh, with individuals who create something, who give, as you call them, gifts to the world, you've laid them out in this book. And was there any, was there any reflexivity to this in that, was, Having, having laid them out clearly, is there any sense in which you then saw them stated by you and then you found, them, you found it looping back in on yourself saying, well, now maybe how can I, how can I apply what I've just laid out to myself and you know, iterate forward in that sense? Does that make any sense? It does. I thought you were going to ask a different question, so I'll answer that one first, okay. which is <laughs> I was worried that as I started to examine this, it would stop being art for uh -huh. other people. So I... There was a lot of pressure to give more lists, tell people how to do it, describe how to overcome the resistance. And I resisted all those things because if I tell you what to do, it won't be art anymore. But you're correct that writing the book made me a lot more honest and serious about my own work. There are things that I used to do, choices I used to make that I don't anymore and some of them are, are really uncomfortable. You know, like the easiest thing for me to do would be to go to my publisher and say, okay, here's a three book deal, uh, the permission marketing workbook, Purple Cow 2, and How to Be a Lynchpin. And if I sold him those three books, he'd sell plenty. But I can't do that now. And I'm, and I'm glad I can't do that. It's cut off that avenue for you? And that would have well, been open I, before? I'm not even interested in it because why would I be doing it? This has made you uninterested or you already were uninterested? In I was that? already, I mean, I never wrote a sequel before on purpose, but now I know why. And now it's ever easier to resist the temptation. Certainly you have, if nothing else, you do have this public example of all these, of all these, I said not principles before, but I'll call them principles now, uh, that, you, you've, that you've laid out. And if you, if, you, if you violate them yourself, that's going to... Well, we talked about being laughed at. I guess that would be an occasion to be laughed at. No, <laughs> I'm no. not going to give you that one. Sorry. I think that there's, you know, there are plenty, you know, to use Bob Dylan as an example. If Bob Dylan wanted to make a Willie Nelson type oldies record where he sang his old songs again and it looked like he was cashing out, one could say, okay, we're going to laugh at you for selling out. Then it becomes recursive right? Then it's just self-referential and maybe that's why he did it. And I want to ask one last thing about this book, which is, I, I know you get a lot, of, a lot of email, you talk about the volume, you get of responses to blog posts and whatnot. I want to know how, how, 
How wide a range of interpretation have you seen of the ideas you've written about in Lynchpin? Because I can see these being used a million different ways. I want to know if, if anything has surprised you about the way people have received and have executed or acted on or reinterpreted these ideas. Yeah, I, well, there's one big surprise. You know, what tends to happen, as I told you with the real estate brokers, is people read Purple Cow and they write me notes saying, I'm a Purple Cow, even though they're not. People read Lynchpin, the resistance kicks in, they redefine what it means to be a Lynchpin, they announce they are one, and they tell me. Uh, that's what I expected. But what has been extraordinary to me is the range of people who are, in a really heartfelt, genuine way, sharing the fear that they had been wrestling with, the paralysis that they had been feeling, and how they were able to now get through it. Uh, particularly the audio. The audio of this is selling better than any audio I've ever done. Why do you think the audio sells better? Because you can listen to it over and over again. Hmm. And so what I'm hearing is people are putting it in, on in their car and leaving it there. That they, Then I got a note from Australia. A woman said her 14-year-old uh, was in the back seat. She picked him up from school. And when they got home, the kid stayed in the car with her for 20 more minutes to finish that section <laughs> because it, the, the lessons about school and being brainwashed were so resonating with him. And when I hear stuff like that, that goes a long way to making up for you know, the anxiety and hassle of putting something like this out in the world. It, 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 I, don't, I already get way more than my fair share of positive feedback, way more than my fair share of reward for the work I do. Um, but it, when it's that... Uh, personal. It's really uh, remarkable. And it's the kind of thing that you, you treasure for a long time. To pull a term from the book, it seems like you've, you can really feel you've given a gift in that sense. Yeah, exactly. The book once again is Lynchpin. Are you indispensable? Seth Godin, thank you so much. It's been an honor. Thank you. This was a great interview. I really appreciate the, the, the attention you put into it. So have fun. If you'd like to learn more about Seth Godin, visit Seth Godin, S E T H G O D I N, dot com. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. You can find our complete interview archive and much more at colinmarshallradio.com. Ben Althaus, who produces our theme music, keeps a homepage at benalthaus.com as well. If you have any kind of feedback whatsoever, questions, comments, rebuttals, rebukes, accolades, anything, send that along to Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Thank you again for tuning in. We will catch you next time. <laughs>